That's great. All right, good evening, everybody. I'd like to get started. We have a nice, hefty agenda in front of us. So may I have um, an approval of tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, presentations and discussions of, discussions of interest. Mike? Jean? I think the, the question is whether um, you want to be looking at the screen or yeah, whether your paper copy is enough and you want to stay here. Um, I would like to go down. Yeah, I'd like to go down. And then maybe we'll bring the three principals um, up here and because you're going to be jumping in, am I right? Okay. And I think I will stay up here too. <laughs> we'll see if we can sit there. Just uh, introduce you in a second. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Horton. I am the Director for Curriculum and Assessment for STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, and my colleague. Hi, I'm Jean Witt. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Assessment for the Community, so ELA and So this is our annual uh, standardized test report, um, state standardized test report, um, summing up PARC results and MCAS results for the high school in science. Uh, there's a variety of ways to disseminate the, the data, to, to analyze it. Um, we could report it through growth percentiles. We could report it through combined advanced and proficient scores. Um, we can look at trends over time. We can compare groups of students to other groups of students or follow the same students over time. Uh, we can get to CPI, uh, Composite Performance Index. We get into PPI, we're gonna see PPI, um, a variety of different ways. Um, we've chosen to go with CPI, which uh, this report has been done in this fashion in the past, where we look at uh, student scores over time in the same scale, okay? Um, we felt that CPI is the best apples to apples measure we have right now when you consider that students took MCAS um, for seven, eight years, uh, nine years, and then the last two years in grades three through eight have taken PARC, okay? Uh, MCAS might be scaled from 200 to 280, and PARC is scaled from 650 to 850, um, but CPI, it's all out of 100, okay? And the way it is in the spaghetti sauce, it's all in there. Um, sometimes if you look at um, advanced scores or proficient and advanced, you may have increased in proficient and advanced, but at the same time you may have also increased at the other end in your warning and failing. Um, CPA, CPI takes that all into account by leveling everything to the same out of 100 uh, scale. So just a refresher, uh, what CPI is, is that um, students are given a point value, each student, special ed, ELL, even MCAS all, it's all, it's all in there. Um, if a student is proficient, they earn 100 points. Um, if a student is advanced, they earn the same 100 points. Um, it's interesting to note that, you know, when No Child Left Behind began early 2000s about the MCAS system here in Massachusetts, the goal was that all students would be 100 by 2014. And the state kind of had to correct that statement that we don't mean everyone to be per perfect, but everyone to be at the proficient level. And it's interesting to note that proficient is usually a cutoff around 70%. Um, so if there's a 60 question um, high school math MCAS and students got 40 out of 60 points, they may actually be proficient or 100, even though that percent wise or accuracy is at 67%. So I put the percent correct in there as well. Um, below the line, uh, students would score 75 points if they're in the high needs improvement category, and then it goes down from there 25 point increments, okay? Um, what's interesting to note is that the state sets these cutoffs, okay? They, they waver a little bit in terms of the percent correct. 
So through that, they have kind of control over where to set their bar, whether they do a norm reference graph, a typical bell curve, or what. That does help them calibrate tests from one year to the next. If a, a test seems to be harder, um, they might curve the test a little bit more. If a test is easier, they might change the scale a little bit. This is why we find over the last 11 years, this is the most apples to apples um, comparison because students are all on the same scale. They are given point values relative to their peers across the state who took the exact same standardized test. So what you're going to see are in the blue lines are going to be um, line graphs, which are very visual over time. And you're going to see our scores um, from grades 3 all the way through 10. Um, and then the red line is going to be the state CPI. And the state CPI is there until this current year. Um, the state has said that they do not have a state CPI right now um, for PARC because allegedly not enough um, students participated in PARC to make a proper representative <coughs> sample. Okay? However, as someone who loves graphs and why we present like this is visually you can see and you can really estimate if you extend out the line about where the state CPI <coughs> would be. Yes. Okay? Um, and again, I just want to point out that because the state controls where they put these cutoffs, they kind of have some say in the fact that that line has stayed pretty flat or maybe a slight increase over the last 11 years. So each principal is going to go through and present their grades. Um, Gene's going to talk about uh, students over time and as they progress in grades three up through high school. And then I'm going to wrap it up with accountability, okay, which is one of the more recent um, measures of a, of a school and a district. So Kim is going to start with grade three ELA. Thank you. And thank you to Mike for helping put all of this together. Um, when you look at this graph, what is delightful to see is, but really important to understand, this is the third grade over time. Not the same children, but the third grade over time. So um, in the last three years, there has been an upturn, which we feel pretty good about. And certainly I feel a little bit happier sitting here this year than I did last year, but I will always remark that these are tests. It isn't the full measure of our children. However, I can um, smile a little bit more this year because these uh, marks have gone up. Um, Mike just raised the point about the red line does not go to 2016. Because of that park piece, they don't have the red line for the state. However, you can see that we are um, closely approximating the state level. Grade four. Um, this has um, also gone up for us um, nearly uh, 8.7 points from last year, park to park. So those are the uh, CPIs from 2015 and 2016. Those are park scores. Um, and so we are on an upturn here. Uh, we are pleased with that. Uh, the state has really been um, flatlining, and so we are hoping that we are getting close to the state average. Um, we certainly have raised the rigor with uh, text complexity and use of informational text. In addition, um, for the last three years, closer in the last two, we have really formalized our writing process, and um, I believe that that focus in writing has really been assisting us here. grade five ELA. So we do have a concern about a slight dip here. Um, and, and we talked today at our staff meeting and we're all trying to come up with what might that dip be. And it could be any one of a number of variables that could include we've been platooning for the last three years. Um, the park test. This is different than the MCAS test. Um, Really, a big, uh, a big variable is we did increase the amount of math time we're teaching in classrooms. So it used to be an hour, and for the last two years, we've been doing 75 minutes. So we are taking 15 minutes from somewhere. 
um, but math has been our focus. If uh, Mike, maybe you could just click back. If you go back to grade four, so remember these are grade level, not the same kids. So if you look at the uh, class of 2015, their first park score in ELA grade four was 62.2. .2. So then if you go to grade five ELA, those children are 2016 and they're at 76.8. So we're certainly looking at this information and saying, okay, that's an uptick for that group of students, but it is down a little bit. Grade three math. We're very excited about grade three math. Um, so there is really nice growth here. And I do like to look at 2014 was MCAS. And then our first year of park was 81.5. Mm -hmm. And if you look, we're fairly close to the state average there in CPI. And we are, if you follow the trend with the state line, ab above that for third grade. So now we start to think about, well, what happened in third grade? So last year we did put in ST Math, which is a computer program that we have done with children that um, really is about concepts and not about language. And they are doing this program, uh, sometimes they do it whole class and other times they are doing it as an independent activity or a center activity. But we do think that that may have played a positive role for us and we did roll that forward so that our new third grade students are doing ST math this year and our fourth grade students who did it last year are doing it again this year. Um, the other thing that's important to mention is when we get ELL students in kindergarten and we keep them, these are kids who we potentially have been working with for four years, some of those students, a large group of them, and um, they did beautifully on the access this past year. So their growth in English language has been significant and we think that that also could have played a role here. Um, great work, thank you. So again, an upturn here from 63 the first time we did park to 73. And so if you draw out that red line, we're hoping we're at that state average, if not going up towards it. Um, remember, there is, we don't have that CPI there. Um, and we feel good about this math growth that um, we dropped a little bit from MCAS <coughs> to park, which is significant for the first time that those children had taken um, park and then gone up almost 10 points. Grade four. So then we go to grade five math, CPI. Is, um, that's been going up from our first park at 73.5 up to 77. So also going up, we like that. Um, I mentioned before that we are spending 75 minutes on math. That is the platoon where we have two teachers who are um, teaching math and that is a strong suit for them. That's uh, their experience has been in math teaching. But also for the whole building with math being a focus, we switched the way we do math instruction um, and mirrored that with the way we've done ELA instruction where there is a whole group lesson and then there are small group lessons and then there are centers, games, independent work. And that work is differentiated based on the learners. But in spending 75 minutes in math, doing it in that fashion, we feel like we're um, better meeting the needs of our kids. Um, this is certainly the increase from last year, and we're getting close to that state average. Uh, and I will certainly talk a little bit more about this in our school improvement plan. So here is grade five science. So. Um, this one was a little harder to share today with our staff because it is dropping. Uh, so 73.6, this is now also, it's the same MCAS test, no park in science. So this is just the same MCAS test that we've been giving for the last 10 years. Um, notice, if you will, that the red line does go to 2016 because it is MCAS, but that seems to be dropping the state red line seems to be dropping a bit. Um, we know that this is an area of focus for us, 
and needs to be an area of focus. Um, we, we don't love that it's dropped a bit, but I'll keep saying our big area this year to focus on, and for the last couple of years, continuing this year, is math. And so when we talk about 75 minutes of math instruction and 90 minutes of ELA instruction and 30 minutes of writing instruction, there it's time. So our focus has been math and literacy. Um, the fifth grade science test is a cumulative test. It will not change this year. Uh, there are new science standards. And so our, our focus for this year, because the math test is not going to change, is instead all of our staff are becoming familiar with the new science standards. They're taking a look at that. It will be a spiraled curriculum, meaning they'll cover it every year, the three different branches of science, if you will. Um, but we've really been focused on math and literacy. So they'll take a look at the new standards and start to see where they can uh, put some of that work in. <coughs> and then um, when the buildings split, we will do a more formalized plan for how we're going to roll out those new standards. Instead, we are becoming familiar. We're looking at what we have, what stays there, what needs to move to a different grade level, and starting to really become familiar with those standards. OK. Uh, admittedly, this isn't my favorite presentation I get to give. Uh, I'd almost rather have a conversation about whether or not Hope Solo is a role model. Um, but. Um, I think that um, we've got some areas to celebrate and some areas to um, really do some reflection on, on how we can turn the scores around. Um, so you saw from Kim's presentation sort of how to read the graphs and the trends. and. Um, to reiterate one thing that, that Kim pointed out is the last two data points that you see um, in 2015, 2016, that's the shift to park testing. All of the data points prior to that are MCAS. And looking ahead, to 2017 will be MCAS again, although it will be version 2.0, which we are all still learning about. So it's why I don't love this presentation right now and this, 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 these years of where we're in flux is that they keep changing the test. And so it, to me, it, it, it um, speaks to the, the overall validity, validity of these results. So this is just one data point um, of many that we collect throughout the year. That being said, let's look at the graphs. So it's sixth grade ELA is up there now on the screen. Um, and you can see uh, those results are uh, relatively flat, um, and uh, from particularly the two years of park um, are um, very close to one another. Um, we have uh, done some things to, to try to address that. Um, there's some changing in staffing. We have a new literacy intervention program for all three grade le levels. Um, and um, I'll talk about this when we talk about math, but one thing to um, note is that, um, you know, we have two math teachers in sixth grade. Whether or not we continue with that, that's a decision we're going to make this year. And maybe the shift ends up being uh, a reading for all in sixth grade and, and having reading and writing in sixth grade. That's one option that we'll consider. So there's lots of things to, to consider on how we can address the sixth grade scores. But the data point on this uh, slide that I want you to focus on is the 80.6 in 2015, and then go to the next slide, because that group in 2016 goes all the way up to 90.5. Um, so that's, to me, um, an indication of um, impressive growth for, of that cohort from one year to the next, um, from the first year of park to the second year of park. Um, as you know, in seventh grade, we have um, an ELA teacher and a writing teacher. I think that that uh, trend is, the, the data trend is, is um, indicative of the fact that we've, we have that extra time on literacy um, and that writing program is starting to pay off. Um, and so, there's um, some really nice growth and that's really an area um, to celebrate. Um, and then if you do the same thing and you focus on the 2015 data point of 84.8 on this slide, and Michael, go to the next one, it goes all the way up to 92.1. So again, our, our ELA scores, um, I feel like overall are trending well. Um, and we look at the middle school as three years of preparation for um, high school and beyond. And so our students are, are in ELA are making um, 
some nice gains uh, over their three years from the time they enter in sixth grade to the time time they leave in eighth grade. Um, And um, we're going to continue to try to improve our our instruction and um, improve our formative assessments so that when we get to this summative assessment, it's it's not a surprise that it's more in line with what we're seeing in formative assessments throughout the year, um, including our our, uh, report card uh, data and our map data. We want all of that. We've heard us talk about the term triangulation. We want all those data points to be more in in sync than maybe they have been. Uh, We can go to math. So uh, this is the, uh, you can see pretty flat uh, results in in sixth grade and and the two years of park uh, slightly down from the first year to the second year. This is um, currently we are in our uh, third year this year of having two math teachers at the sixth grade level. We are looking very hard at that this year and whether or not um, it will continue because uh, you can see the results have not been what we thought they would be by going that route. Um, so we're making some adjustments already to the approach this year. Um, um, Michael Horton and I and, and Donna Johnson are working with the sixth grade math team to be able to um, ad- adjust the approach. There's some staffing changes there as well uh, with a new math teacher uh, on that t- uh, team. We've got a math interventionist uh, in place. Um, and so we hope to be able to see some uh, some gains uh, moving forward, uh, but we're going to have to make uh, a decision very uh, soon about whether or not we'll continue with, with two um, two math teachers at the sixth grade level. And again, um, there's lots of factors that contribute to these scores, and I, I think literacy is part of it. I think some of, uh, even though the trend, the the data is trending in the right way with the ELA scores. I think that some, sometimes the, our overall literacy skills are impacting our, our math scores, um, certainly with our English language learners, for example. Um, in grade seven, um, you can't do the same uh, tr- trend that uh, I tried to do with, the, with ELA because the results go down um, in grade seven. So this is really the area of, of most significant concern for me and for the school. And so we're going to take a hard look at our seventh grade math um, and look at, at the approach that we're taking there, um, look at professional development opportunities, and again, how the math interventionists can support the seventh grade uh, math program and, and hopefully um, turn these results into a, a, a different direction. Eighth grade, uh, similar, uh, more similar to to, uh, to six in terms in terms of trend, pretty pretty flat, uh, though trending in the wrong direction. Um, we've already made a significant adjustment this year for eighth grade math. So in the past, um, some students were identified as being. Um, advanced math students and so they were in a a different math class than uh, their peers and in that class we tried to do um, all of the eighth grade math standards and and the algebra uh, standards as well we've separated that out now so all eighth grade students are going to have those eighth grade math standards that will be tested and then our advanced students have qualified for a separate algebra one class so they're getting a double dose but in a much different way than we've done in the past and very different from what we do in sixth grade. So we've already made a significant change and and we'll have to wait and see what the results are on the new uh, MCAS test. Our science uh, Mm. results have been um, very very flat over the years as have the the state line. So we're pretty much in line with the state. Um, we're already uh, making, we're on a three-year plan. I'll talk about this in the improvement plan a little bit, but our free, three-year plan of uh, implementation of shifting our, our science to the new frameworks. Um, so Massachusetts has adopted new science frameworks. This year, our uh, sixth grade is uh, working under those new frameworks next year, both sixth and seventh, and the following year, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, so the way the test works, they get tested in science in fifth grade, as you saw on Kim's slide, and then not again till eighth grade. So as a result, our eighth grade science teachers had to um, kind of go back and review some things from sixth and seventh in advance of the uh, science MCAS. Now the, the curriculum is more spiraled so that um, we expect that we'll see uh, some better, uh, better results uh, than we have, although the science results um, have been pretty consistent. So those are the uh, middle school CPI scores.
So for the high school, it's a good night to be the high school principal, um, but I would echo my colleagues' uh, comments that this is a single snapshot, a data point in time, and just as I don't get too bummed out or upset uh, about the scores, I don't get overly excited and thrilled um, when they're trending the way they are this year. That said, if you look at <coughs> the last three years in ELA, for the high school, um, 94, a slight dip last year, and then a jump back up to where we were the three years pri previously in 2011, 12, and 13. Um, for math, we did a little bit better this year, but not great, given that our focus uh, and our school improvement plan focus is on math and math improvement. I think we would have liked to have seen it get closer uh, to the state average and certainly to be back up where we were in 2013, uh, but we are pleased with the uh, uptick in math this year, but we'll continue to focus on that. The real success story for me is science. Um, all of our freshmen <coughs> take biology, and I might argue it is one of our most challenging courses just because of the density of the material and the depth. Uh, a lot of our freshmen, I think that is the shocker course uh, coming into the high school in terms of the, uh, the material and the course load and the homework. Um, and as you know, we have made some significant changes uh, in science staffing over the last uh, three or four years. And so to see an increase uh, from last year to this year uh, of that jump is certainly pleasing for us. Next slide is <coughs> One of my favorites, I think, um, because it looks at <coughs> the class of 2018 uh, over time, and you can see that there is steady improvement. And the improvement is important to me because the demographics of that class, if you look at the enrollment data from when they were in NES and CPS, and just in numbers and makeup of the class, it's changed yes. pretty significantly. So to see the trend data from six, seven, eight to 10 uh, on the upward swing, and then to triangulate that, as Peter said, with other data points that we will have uh, with AP results, SAT results, um, my prediction is that those will also be strong. For math? I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump in, if, if I may, on this. You'll see something that we've talked about year after year, and that's the dip in fourth grade. And uh, just wanted to point that out that uh, that you'll see that in the uh, math and ELA, and and I think Jean's going to speak to that when she she shows you another graph over time. Um, but and one thing that I will say too is that we don't have the state line on here um, because it would be too much um, to show, but this fourth grade dip is, is something that happens statewide. It is, is not a unique Nantucket phenomenon at all. Um, so it is a piece that's there. <coughs> so a similar graph uh, with math for the class of 2018, starting when uh, they were at NES in third grade and ending up when they took the test uh, last spring uh, at that 85. I think, again, the demographics and the makeup, that is a different class. And for the steady growth and improvement, I think is something for the district to celebrate. Science, same thing. Fewer data points, though, because they only test science in fifth, eighth, and ninth. And so that's a pretty significant increase over the eighth grade score from the 70.8 to a 92.4. So as I said, science is really our biggest <coughs> success story to see as opposed to my English language skills this evening. <laughs> So thank you. I'm just going to pull some things together, and then Jean's going to get the last word. Um, I just want to hover on this slide for a minute um, because it's significant to point out that the fifth grade science test is the science and technology and engineering test, meaning it covers a variety of topics going back to, back, back to kindergarten. It is a cumulative test. The water cycle is on it from, from grade three. The rock cycle is on it from grade four. Life cycles and ecosystems, and even earlier, is on this test, okay? In grade eight, there's more information. There's even more knowledge 
content padded in. So that explains that dip to some degree. And then when the students pick one subject, and in high school it's biology, they can crank on biology, okay? So it's great to think, all right, what are we doing to prepare students for the next step? What are we getting them ready for the next step? But high school, they have a choice of whether they take biology um, or chemistry or, or another science subject. That's important to point out. Last note on this slide is these are the most recent students. So 2019 are current uh, sophomores because they just took the test as, as freshmen. Um, if you were to look at the 2016 eighth graders and 2016 fifth graders, those numbers have reversed, where you, the 77 is more common in the middle school at grade eight, and as you saw, we've had this dip um, in, uh, in, in the fifth grade. And, and Kim talked about um, how we've put a lot of attention and time into math, and you know, it's something that we're working on for the shift to the next generation science standards. So what does it all mean? Um, at the end of the day, it gets translated into accountability. And every school is given a level, um, you may remember, one through five. One is you're doing wonderfully. You're doing a great job, OK? Five, not so much. That would be the old corrective action or restructuring, where the state is taking over. They're making some decisions in administration and curriculum, personnel. Um, so you don't want to be four and five. You might get more support in level three, but really want to be one and two, OK? Um, your CPI is the basis for PPI, okay? Um, which is going to be a variety of things about narrowing the gap for what your target is over six years. Back to my original uh, first slide is that the plan for No Child Left Behind is that all students would be, would be proficient or above in 2014. They would, everyone would be at 100, okay? Well, that didn't happen. So in around 2011, state realized this is not going to work out, okay? So we, they shifted to a new system where you take your baseline in 2011 and you imagine that you would have a 100 score in 2017. So for example, if we were at a 76 in 2011 and we want to be a target of 100 in 2017, that could be our six-year target from 2011 to 2017. State realizes, well, that's really just taking 2014 and giving everyone three more years, okay? That's not practical, it's not realistic. So what they did is they took the difference between the 100 and the uh, 74 and they cut it in half, okay? So instead of having to go up uh, 26 points, you only have to go up 13 points, all right? So then if your goal from 76 add 13 is actually an 89. And as you saw in one of the earlier slides, our grade three is there at 88, okay? That is great. If they can maintain that, if those students moving from grade three to grade four can come with the background knowledge that they should bring that, th those scores up to grade four. Um, you know, it's great to show growth, but realize we want to be in the 90s, okay? The high school math department being at 85, as, as John um, pointed out, is a nice little uptick, but we really want to be up there in the 90s, okay? 80s are okay. 70s, we're getting low 70s, high 60s, that's a real area of concern, but we want to move that up. In the end, the school will get a value for PPI, okay? That goes into determining a cumulative PPI, which is reported on accountability reports, okay? So here is, here are our PPIs for the last few years, okay? And it is awesome to point out that NES and NHS made their goal of 75, okay? Um, the goal for one single year is to reach 75 for your PPI, okay? Um, CPS 60, District 66, okay, got some work to do, but notice that your cumulative PPI, the, the, the furthermost column there, okay, is what's reported on accountability. If you go to look at any of our state reports, right now NES is at 59. And how we get that is you, you put all these together, but it's not averaged the same, it's weighted, okay? Just like a power law, the most recent score is weighted more heavily. So it's awesome to see 2016 is times four for the 75. That will stick with us the next three, day, next three years, okay? That's the same for the high school, that's excellent news. 
even better news for NES is that this 45 will drop off next year, and this 30, instead of being times two, will only be times one. So as long as NES can keep a number above 45, okay, and I, I think we can do it with what we have from this year, we're looking pretty good here. The reason why I say that is that um, Abby correctly reported the last couple of years is that we flirted with being a level three school because we were in the bottom 20 percentile. If you're a 20 percentile or lower for like schools at the elementary level, you're automatically level three, okay? The only reason why we were held at level two is we were held harmless because we participated in park, okay? Schools were giving incentives that if you participate in park, you would maintain the same level that you had two years prior. Okay, you could not go lower. All right, so it's important to say that we were flirting with level three at the elementary school with some of the results that you saw in the last couple of years. But this is really good news. This is really good news because this is going to live with us the next few years. We're going to drop this out. Okay, the high school, you know, we got to keep going here because this 84 will be dropped. These will be a little bit less, but with this 75, and maybe hopefully another 75 or similar, you know, the high school will maintain its high status as well, okay? All schools are level two, therefore the district is level two. The district is whatever is the lowest level uh, or the worst level of any of your schools. How did we get there? Okay, this is my last slide, I promise, and then Gene's gonna talk about the summer, summary celebration. And this is something that brought the house down today at NES, okay? <laughs> You get bonus points, all right? You, you get scores for um, you know, narrowing your proficiency gaps, and you saw that in math. Um, if you, you get closer uh, for, for ELA, that's great. Um, if you increase your ELA advanced, you get bonus points. If you decrease your ELA warning failing, you also get bonus points. You get two opportunities for bonus points in math. You get two opportunities for bonus points in science. This, all, th all schools get a chance to show growth in their English language learner language growth percentile, and the increase relative to like students from the previous year. NES earned 25 points. That is not common, okay? I, I, I struggled to find other districts that earned this <laughs> bonus point here, okay? So of 175 possible bonus points, NES got 150 of them, okay? That is really something to celebrate, okay? See a little more points here, but you also can notice that we didn't get any bonus points in science. That's the missing area. As Peter said, you know, there's some great news to share tonight, but there's also some bad news and some things that we know we have to work on, okay? Um, Gene's gonna wrap it up with this slide here. <coughs> Since I'm new, they just gave me the easy one. I've got all the celebrations. Um, so just, and this was all in the slides and you can look back at it, but some things to celebrate um, are that the ELA CPI has increased in grades three and four and seven and eight and 10. The math CPI has increased in grades three and four and five and 10. And our science CPI has increased in grades eight and 10. So. PPI has also increased for all three schools from 2015 to 2016, which is good news. And NES and NHS made the target of 75. Um, this data also informs, and I will point out also the personal best, but it informs what we need to continue to work on and what we need to start working on. Um, and it shows that our focus on math has certainly helped um, our scores grow at the elementary level and we're hoping that we can continue to implement changes in programming and math and give good attention to that but also looking at the next generation science standards. Um, the, the personal bests are the grade three math at 88.6 and the NHS biology at 92.4. Um, and one thing that I did want to say after looking at this data from an ELA and ELL lens is the growth that we made at NES for ELL students is something that's commendable. We have a large ELL population that is growing and will likely continue to grow. Um, we're doing a good job working with those students and getting them engaged and 
getting them to increase their English language proficiency. I think that that also can help their math scores because I think that the literacy level that you need to read a math problem and solve a word problem with the park test is extreme. You, you need a high amount of literacy to do that. So I think that speaks to, yes, we need to continue to focus our energy on math, um, but we can't ignore the literacy piece of it. And I think if you looked at this growth over time of students, we are preparing our students as a district and we are increasing the growth over time, which is wonderful. We need to keep building a good, strong literacy and numeracy foundation at the middle school and keep that going throughout the schools and, and really establish the idea that in our schools, we are all literacy and numeracy teachers. We are all teaching those skills um, rather than this data just being owned by the individual content areas that are tested. And I think that's important to remember and that's something that we can look to do as a district. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Questions, comments? Colleagues, you want to start? Sure, I just a lot of information to take in, but I think it's encouraging, as we've all said. I think we're definitely in the right direction, um, pointing out some of the, the areas that we need to focus on. But this is encouraging to me to, to see the level of detail. I appreciate the presentation. I appreciate the visual presentation and the ex explanation because this is not an easy thing for parents and mm -hmm. families to get their head around and, and I think for us who are not in this day to day and there's a lot of data and there's a lot of ways that you can read it but I think in tonight's presentation it's the clearest I've seen and I think will help our community understand where we are so thank you. Yeah. Tim? I'm encouraged by the results I think at the elementary school seeing that improvement I'm very interested also in the NHS biology, but uh, that's very interesting because that's a tough subject. Our pleasure. Trade, trade places, there won't be a presentation. Oh, there isn't. Okay. No, that's fine then. We'll right. Yes. Sorry. We'll sit there. I'm sitting here. here. Yeah. 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 Careful, you wish for For the improvement now. No, that's okay. Nantucket Elementary School School Improvement Plan. Uh, this was shared with our school council, uh, which changed a little bit this year. So we had some new people that weren't so sure what kinds of changes they, they thought they should make. And so taking a look at the data that I just shared and our plan <coughs> from last year, there are not a ton of significant changes. Uh, the reason for that is twofold. We are in uh, a transition year of getting ready to split our building into two buildings. Uh, but also, more importantly, what we were doing seems to have put us on the right track. So we didn't want to make a lot of significant changes. So what I would do, um, and Zona, I'm happy to meet with you separately. We keep these on our uh, website, but what I will do in the interest of time, uh, certainly answer your questions, but I'll call attention to the changes. So on our first page, the membership has changed a little. Uh, if we go to goal one, which is, I believe, on page three for you, improve academic achievement for all students. So we are keeping those things in place. We are keeping, um, 
our data teams and our grade levels working very closely to pay attention to math, pay attention to writing, and pay attention to reading. And that is work that we did last year. We will uh, maintain that. The highlight in here is in the second block, which is taking a look at our AYP, but um, I highlighted in pink the changes to maintain our upturn in performance. Uh, in the third block, I mentioned this earlier, but we are doing that differentiated instruction by teaching the whole group grade level standard, breaking into our small groups, uh, and then doing stations in math, stations in reading, individual conferences for writing. We will continue to keep those uh, areas of focus for all three content areas there. We will use our benchmarks in our formative assessments um, we the benchmarks are our summative we do those three times a year we will maintain those we have um, upgraded our Ames web which we've used for years to the Ames web plus which is better aligned uh, it's more online and it is uh, giving us deeper information than we have had in the past if you turn to page four uh, the last block is to continue to calibrate grade level teacher scoring to maximize that consistency across the grade level. So that is um, not in jargon, but that is the whole team comes together, they look at a piece of writing and they make sure that they are evaluating that piece of writing using the same rubric and evaluating it in the same way. Uh, and so that's really the calibrating of every teacher at that team. We'll do some work with that vertically throughout the year as well. Uh, certainly we use our teachers college writing rubrics, but we have our math expressions and we have um, Optus and Pinnell and um, our other benchmarks that we use Ames Web Plus. In goal two, these are our instructional routines and we want to support differentiated instruction. So this year, um, placement at the elementary school is always a significant challenge that we put a lot of time and energy <coughs> into. This year what we tried to do is look closely at the entire grade level and get a sense of who each child was or is as a learner. And then in order to better support classroom teachers, we tried to narrow the continuum. So if you went with 130 kids and you're going to split them into six classrooms, you could end up with potentially eight reading groups in a classroom seven math groups in a classroom. <clears throat> this time what we did was we looked at all our data that we've had on our children as they were moving up and we tried to narrow that continuum so that a classroom teacher may only have four reading groups so that they could really um, intensely work on those groups and not have to spread themselves so thin across seven different groups of kids. It's not perfect, but <clears throat> we hope that we'll be a little bit closer than we have been in the past. That's, um, so the highlight in that first block is just that we tried to tighten those groups of students so that there are smaller continuums in each classroom. Uh, over to page five. Uh, these all stay the same. That uh, second block is just how you do data review. Um, we are still doing our SMART goals and there are educator evaluation, the plans to target those specific student learning needs as well as pra professional practice goals. In the last one, we, we work on a budget. Uh, my budget will look very different, I think, this year. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I have wanted to do because it's a personal area of challenge for me um, is to work very closely with Martin. I know we've talked about not doing big transfers, really trying to look at where have we spent our money over my last five years. And so we actually have our appointments scheduled for next week, Martin and I. Um, but trying to get those, those budget lines better aligned. Uh, on page six, goal three is our positive classroom and school climate, uh, providing a safe and secure school. We are using responsive classroom as we always do. We're in our first six weeks of school, which is something that um, we, we feel is important to set up those routines for kids to have a structure that they can count on and really build on so that we can spend more time teaching and less time 
dealing with other interruptions to the teaching. Um, the other blocks there were all the same. Um, certainly communication around the construction project has been ongoing for the last two years. But the bottom two are to work with the staff to help plan our transition for half of the staff to move to the other building and then also work with the staff to plan what uh, will be our new NES pre-K-2. On page seven, uh, nothing changes in the families and community members. There is a new person at NHA. We will still have Night Watch. He is getting ready to come in and do the uh, Museum in My School program that really was beautiful for three or four years in a row. Last year it fell off a little bit, but we've got a new gentleman who's really anxious to get going, and uh, he's been in regular communication and ready to go. So we're excited about that. Uh, goal five is about professional development. And we have um, Ames Web Plus training. We, uh, Mike has come in and done some Aspen training with our staff. We had some of that in the professional days before school started. We do offer some online courses for our staff. We've had little snack groups and we meet on Monday nights and take some online courses together. Uh, Nina is terrific about finding those things that really we've done math. We did math uh, last year and we did writing the year before that. Uh, so we'll look to do that again this year. Uh, the second or last block on this page is instructional cycles. <coughs> and I believe, I don't want to speak for you too, but I think that we, um, all three of us will have this. This is uh, a way for our staff to select what it is they want to work on. And so they will be doing three cycles for the year. And in each cycle, it takes um, four times, if you will. And what they, the teachers are doing is selecting a strategy that will improve instruction. And they are posing that as something they want to learn about. They pose it out there. We have a Google Doc that they pose it out there. Other people who are interested, they go, they research it. So that's step one. They um, try it out in their classroom. Step two, they observe each other and provide peer feedback to each other. Um, step three is kind of gather that information. How do we do? What will be changed? Um, what else might we want to move towards next? And then reporting that out to others so that it's uh, self-selected, if you will, so it'll hopefully have a higher area of interest for our staff, but also be really impactful to have that feedback from uh, each other. And the very last one on page eight is, uh, as with the superintendent's goals and our district goals to improve morale, so we're doing quarterly gatherings. I do a weekly update to staff where we do some shout outs inside that. Uh, the peer observations, we've already had a lovely breakfast. I did 10 minute meetings with staff, which um, Dr. Bucky does regularly. He does it at the end of the year. I did it this year at the start. Um, and every staff meeting we do feedback forms, so it's a way for teachers to and staff to provide information about anything else they may need. And yes. Thank you very much, Kim. Any questions? Zona? Yep. Melissa? I just was curious because it are, um, in the spring, I think we heard from the um, guidance and social work team about the uh, rising level of anxiety mm -hmm. in young students. And um, I guess I was I'm somewhat, I'm not surprised, but I, I thought maybe that would be something that would be a focus because it seems to be more of a community support focus within mm -hmm. the school. So has that subject come up at any of those meetings and are, are you thinking about it in a different way that doesn't need to necessarily go in the school improvement So, uh, So I didn't put it in the um, uh, school improvement plan and um, this Friday we are, uh, we have four different professional development offerings for staff and one of them is trauma okay. that I believe will talk about that we have all our therapists going all our guidance counselors going our social workers going yes. we um, at the elementary school we did a shift for our student support center that um, and the shift began last year and and we're tweaking it again this year 
to make it better. But what's been happening there is if a student needs to go to the student support center, we have guidance go first mm -hmm. to sit down and see if we can get to the root mm -hmm. of what the issue may be. Mm -hmm. And that is helping guidance counselors tweak the way they did work. They're going in monthly to teach a skill to the whole class, mm -hmm. but then as we are calculating and keeping track of who is visiting the student support center, they are developing small skills groups that they are working with and that's the lunch bunches. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, budget will come mm -hmm. and so we, we will certainly be looking to uh, increase potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I would say is David Siegel is our social worker mm -hmm. and his groups this year are very focused around anxiety, coping, Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. building self-esteem and self-confidence, mm -hmm. how to handle difficult situations, mm -hmm. anger Excellent. management. That's Excellent. the work that he's been doing. Excellent. Thank you. I just I wanted to of course. call it out just because I hadn't seen it. In my yeah, I apologize it. for not listening yeah. in. No, that's it's great. And the only other thing I was thinking about was, um, you know, first of all, I, I guess I, I didn't necessarily have this comment fully formed in the reports, but it, it is tremendously commendable how the NES staff um, have addressed that growing ELL population, and I think it is a nurturing and wonderful environment, and clearly growth is demonstrated in these children being able to be successful, so that's fantastic. Um, do you have ideas on strategizing around science improvement in NES and I want to couch that with I don't know how you fit that in I don't know how you continue the improvement in ELA, ELA. I don't know how you continue the improvement in math squeeze that in deal with things I, I don't know where the time comes from mm -hmm. but I'm just curious you have to manage that time in a day what are you thinking so um, last year we began with the introduction to the new standards and sharing that information. They've all been given the new standards books. We have teachers at this point because we've talked about it in a more exploratory way. Mm -hmm. Start reading them, mm -hmm. become more familiar with them, knowing, not terrific, but knowing that the test isn't going to change. Mm -hmm. This year it's more familiarize yourself with it. Take a look at what you have been doing for science, what still connects, what doesn't connect. And we did start some of that work last year. We had some ambassadors come last mm -hmm. year and uh, spend a day with the grade level teams trying to begin that work. Um, we have some things that we just need to throw out. <laughs> We've yeah. had them for a long time yeah. and uh, they're not appropriate any longer or not just throw out but maybe move up or move down. Yeah. Um, so this year is more about familiarizing. Mm -hmm. Then we will need to be looking at some curricular resources, <coughs> but we see that as Next. the year after. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and um, I will tell you that in reviewing goals right now, there are teachers who are very interested, they're reading them, and they're going to try some new things out in their grade levels. Great, fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm all set, thanks. Polly? Just a couple of questions and put notes in as you were talking. When you were quickly, talking sorry. about, um, <laughs> I wrote quickly. Um, when you were talking about sort of honing in on the level of, of um, abilities in ELL and uh, math in, in your classroom, are children moving from class to class between their reading and their math, or is it when you're looking at the whole classroom, you're trying to sort of put the best grouping as you can to sort of contain English language arts and math, or do children typically? remain in the same levels for both subjects? So with the exception of fifth grade, mm -hmm. which is platooning, so that's a little bit different, the whole class moves to two different yeah. teachers on two of those teams. They're not moving right now. That's not to say that we might not do some of that work as they progress this. What we did was more about placement last year. So we looked at um, all of our performance data and then tried to say, these children are all at this level reading wise. They're all at this level math wise. Let's make sure each teacher has a tighter group of kids, not to split up around the building or across the different classrooms at that grade level, but to be Mrs. Kubish, the fourth grade teacher, and I will have this group of kids 
that are all working at a similar <coughs> level, and this group, and this group, and this group. It used to be um, that in an effort to be balanced, we, we sort of spread them across the grade level, and then you could have this little group up two, this little one up here who's all by themselves. Um, and so we tried to get it so that there are really more four groups as opposed to those eight groups. In some cases, there are five. The next piece I will tell you is ELL. We had the ELL teachers using uh, data from Access last year and their ELL coursework uh, throughout the year and their performance levels in English, reading and math, and we did group uh, ELL students. They're in every single classroom, but we did try to group them so that they are with similar ability peers in each class. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple of other questions. When you were talking about the professional development and the um, through peer dialogue, is this across the schools or is this just in the elementary or middle? It is across the schools. So it, it as well. <laughs> Peter's going to talk about that. So the Google Doc is for the entire district. Um, the times are different. Uh, the teachers have that opportunity to go and observe other classrooms. So uh, I want that opportunity to go across the district for the elementary school. I worry about their ability time-wise to do that. Um, I think that uh, in the initial introduction, it was shared that we may want to stick to ourselves at the elementary school, although Brincy Basket is probably going to do some work with Jed Williams in an instructional cycle. Um, we don't want to prevent someone. We think it'll be logistically challenging to go across mm -hmm. elementary, middle, and high together, not to say it couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Great. And then just lastly, it's just, I always want to look at measurement of goals. I mean, are there more ways that you're looking to measure the achievement whether at the end of the year to, to determine whether you've met your goals? Yeah, so we definitely um, look at, and, and it's listed more generically, or um, it'll say the results of the benchmarks. We do use all of that information. That is, in fact, how we um, were able to tighter group students going into this year by looking at Ames Web Performance, by looking at Access, by looking at our um, um, benchmarks, by looking at our math performance. Um, we definitely use that very specifically to help move kids into this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just getting the CPS soccer results here. <laughs> you want to announce them? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so um, our plan is relatively uh, similar to last year as well. Uh, it, it's similar in terms of structure in that we have basically three goals. I'm really going to focus in on pages 8, 9, and 10 of the, of the document that I gave you. Um, and so in the past we've had three, we've added a fourth goal. So the umbrella topics of instruction, intervention, innovation, um, we've added a fourth uh, goal of imagination. Um, and I'll get to what that's all about in a second. So the first goal is about instruction. And we're really focused on, we think this is the, this is the thing that we can control the most. So um, we've got data from a whole bunch of different um, uh, data points and um, whether or not it, it's PARC or MCAS or MAP or, or uh, formative assessments, what we can consistently control is our own instruction. And so we're really focused on improving instruction overall and, and part of that is researching and implementing new instructional practices. Um, that's uh, the instructional cycle process, which we have actually really in a couple of places in this plan, both under instruction and innovation, because we do think it's an innovative teacher-driven model for improving instruction and getting uh, uh, peers into each other's classrooms and by doing so, uh, raising the collective bar um, because they are um, exposing themselves to um, uh, new ideas and, and then also um, 
seeing the great things going on in neighboring classrooms and, and then implementing it in their classrooms as well. To kind of address one of the, the questions earlier, like there there may be a few groups that might meet cross school, but the peer observation piece will likely be isolated within schools just because of logistics of, mm -hmm. of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, as we have been for the past few years, um, uh, we're focused on meeting the needs of, of all students and differentiating our instruction, and, and that includes retail strategies. So we've now reached the point where um, new teachers coming in and our core teachers that have been here for the past few years have all gone through this SEI endorsement class. And so that's enough to sort of check off the box so that they can get relicensed. Now it's, it's um, important for it to start seeing those strategies implemented into classrooms and if you if teachers are effectively implementing those retail strategies it doesn't just help English language learners it helps all students so um, that's an area that we're focused on for improvement this year um, in uh, goal one uh, other um, areas of focus based on the data that you saw earlier tonight is really focused on improving math achievement um, and adjusting the instructional approaches in math um, taking a really um, laser focus to, to the double dose format in sixth grade and, and, and making not only adjustments there, but, but making a decision ultimately this year whether or not to continue or discontinue that, that model. Um, and then adjusting the science, um, as I mentioned earlier, where um, we're phasing that in. So sixth grade is under the, the new frameworks now, um, seventh grade next year, and eighth grade the following year. Um, so those are the areas where we're focused on for under the umbrella of instruction. Goal two is intervention. So what do we do when students struggle to, to learn and what do we do when students come in and they, and they get it? How do we stretch learners? So um, it really probably should be intervention slash extension. Um, uh, some of the things that we're doing for intervention are an, an improved child study team process. Um, and that is with the help of uh, Donna Johnson coming in and, and um, putting in place some uh, improved structures for when a student does throw up that, that flag, hey, I'm struggling, what do we do in the classroom? What do we then do to help teachers that feel like I've, I've tried everything and, and the child's still not, not getting it? Um, what else can we do? So um, putting in place intervention courses like our action literacy and action math courses um, taught by our literacy interventionists and our math interventionists, two positions that um, are, are really the backbone of our intervention, uh, formal intervention process. Um, a lot of the interventions is, is also what can every classroom teacher do to be able to meet the needs of, of kids that struggle. And then at the other end of the spectrum, what are some of the extension opportunities that we can put in place for top students? So um, we've created a newspaper course. We've tried to create a coding course, but so far I'm teaching it, so I don't know how great <laughs> that is, but if we can find a coding teacher, that would be an example of an extension opportunity to, to, uh, for kids that have an area of uh, interest in technology. Uh, we've got a, a logic class in sixth grade um, that is uh, some of our uh, high achieving math students when they were in grade five were identified and placed into this logic class to do some uh, STEM work with, uh, with Tim Saradalis and we'll continue to look at ways that we can um, create these extension opportunities at, at the middle school. Goal three is, is innovation. Um, and so a lot of people just sort of default to thinking about technology and of course that is one thing that we're focused on and, and continuing to figure out uh, now that we are a one-to-one -one school for this is the second year now, how to successfully integrate technology into our classrooms. Um, but also we feel like the, the model of, of uh, instructional cycles that's been mentioned tonight, that teacher-driven professional development is an innovative uh, approach to professional development. Um, we're continuously trying to and successfully ha have been successful in expanding the network for educators so that they've got uh, so they're connected. Connected being that they, um, uh, you know, are networking with each other, networking with people um, around the, the state by going to, to state level conferences, around the country by going to national conferences, um, but also um, through social media like Twitter to be able to um, help connect them to, to new and innovative ideas. Um, We've talked uh, last year quite a bit about our transition to standards-based grading at the sixth grade level. Um, we'll continue those discussions this year um, and to uh, continue to improve that process both at sixth grade but then also talking about whether or not 
um, we would make that shift in seventh and eighth grade and if so what will that shift look like we had a lot of lessons learned from last year um, and then goal four is imagination we, we as a school council struggled whether to put this in here because it's really just kind of asking the big questions just to kind of spark discussion whether or not there are action items here it remains to be seen but we want to at least talk about what would it look like if we could have a longer school day what what would it look like if um, our arts education opportunities were uh, expanded what would it look like if um, uh, content in art and music were much more aligned to um, what's going on in social studies and English and, and, and those kinds of um, uh, interdisciplinary connections that could be made. What, what would it look like if we expand an advisory program, which is something that probably will end up with an action item to be able to really get to know our students and, and um, there's a lot of middle school advisory programs out there and different models that we'll explore this year to, to talk about what that might look like at CPS. And mm -hmm. um, what, what would it look like if we started world languages earlier? Right now we start in seventh grade. Can we move it back to six? Can we move it back even earlier? Just asking those questions to spark um, ideas. Um, this idea of just kind of imagining big picture and then and then talking about within our within our uh, the parameters that we're under like. What can we do to continue to improve um, the education we can deliver at the middle school level? So that's kind of the, the, the summary of our improvement plan for this year. Thank you very much. Pauline, I'll start with you. Okay, I feel like I'm on a game show. <laughs> <laughs> um, my only comment, and I, I love the presentation, is I love that you've added goal four, the imagination. I think that so often we get caught up into making our goals where we see our deficits and where we, we're too busy fixing things and we don't give enough time to dreaming and expanding and being visionary and I think that this is terrific that you've started that dialogue. Thank you. That's a relief because I wasn't sure how that would be received. <laughs> <laughs> how are you going to evaluate that goal? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that's why we struggled whether or not this plan is the right place for it, but we, we felt like it would at least kind of drive the discussions of, at school council. The one, the one that, that um, is most likely to, to be easily measured is the advisory program because that is something mm. that we want to, to implement. The others, again, are kind of like more kind of big idea questions and just, just then exploring if there's something that we latch onto when asking the question, how could, how could we make that a reality? But some of these are, you know, contract related. Some of them are, have, are you know, out of the control of just the school council or, or um, just the principal. So um, you're right, they're, they're not necessarily as smart in their nature as the other uh, goals. At some point, would we be privy to that types of, the types of discussions that went on around that? Yeah, I think we've got to do probably a better job of taking minutes of the discussions we have at school council and posting those minutes. There are open meetings, and, and, and we, we take minutes, but they're not necessarily as detailed as probably they could be. But with these, I think we would want to open that up and, and then carry it up onto the <coughs> coffees as well to kind of tie the discussion to the larger group. Mm. I have to say I agree. I, I love this school four. I was a little surprised that school uniforms <laughs> were not listed there <laughs> thought, under I imagination. I, yeah, I thought about it there, but the, we've we've talked about it here, so right. it's not like a new like dreaming thing. <laughs> right, but, but, I understand. Uh, that is definitely a, something that we're still strongly considering. Yes, thank you very much, <laughs> Melissa. Um, yeah, uh, just to echo that, I think it's. It's one of the things that I probably lament the most is not is feeling a little bit of a disconnect with the school council's opinions on some of these growth opportunities. And so I like the idea of um, all of our schools being able to, to um, tackle, school councils be able to tackle some of those things so that we can get some great feedback here. Um, in terms of what effects they may have on contracts or budget line items and things like that, the things that we do, uh, the school committee has per year. Or, um, just to, to go back to math for a second, because um, I, I struggle with the results actually indicating that a double math session's not working, and I'll be really curious to see how you evaluate that. But I'm curious about the curriculum, and is that something that is, it, you're evaluating with that because it, you have to wonder if increased instruction is not quite getting us where we want to be. Is it the content that we're learning and how we're pacing that is the issue? Um, so, what are you? What are your thoughts on 
on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's so many factors that we need that we need to be talking about. So yeah. curriculum is certainly one of them. Wh- whether or not, like, so the double dose with when you have, it's not technically a double dose in that that a, a double dose would would be like you get math and then you double those minutes and we have doubled the amount of time students are spending on math but what we have done the past couple years is taken the sixth grade standards split them in half between the two teachers Mm -hmm. so that each teacher could spend more time going on on those stairs and hopefully go deeper Um, and so one of the things we're talking about now is rather than do that what if one teacher covers all the standards and then there's like some flexible grouping based on assessments and so you kind of react to like you give a uh, an assessment on uh, fractions and then th- then you mix up the kids based on those that get it you stretch them those that don't you, you <coughs> reteach and, and mm-hmm. drill down with that and so looking at like okay let's how can we take advantage of the fact that we do have double the minutes in the schedule right, but not do it the same in. way okay. so, so so it's not necessarily going to abandon it but okay. but then also looking at curriculum materials as well <laughs> yeah. um uh mike michael being on board in this position i think that's that, that's going to help the whole district yeah. and certainly the middle school um where we've got um uh, a director of curriculum focused on math specifically mm-hmm. and and um so I think he will help us look at the materials and and kind of decide like do we shift towards being more aligned with some of the materials that are being used at the high school mm-hmm. like uh, Eureka Math for mm-hmm. example and so there's lots of uh, lots of lots of ways to kind of look at this. That was a conversation we had uh, years ago was you know the sort of vertical alignment of the math curriculum. How is it translating from NES to CPS and to NHS? And again, when you see the class results of, say, the class of, I'm going to pick 2018 because I have a student in that class, where you see where they start in third grade, you see everyone's natural dip and forth, and I mean, it's you can't argue that our students are successful. Um, but I just am curious about this one little sort of pinch point that we're feeling is, is it, and, and I, I agree, I'm glad that we've got um, Mike's a- ability to have full attention on math as opposed to one curriculum and assessment director was looking at all of the alignment. Um, in any case, one of the things I, I thought about, um, and I, I offer this to, to anybody, but you know that there's an assumption that parents can keep up with their students' grades and performance by just simply checking Aspen. And I don't know if the Google Classroom um, access has has launched yet or not, but um, I imagine there's a number of parents who are technologically challenged and getting, um, staying on top of your students' progress becomes difficult when if you have that barrier of not being able to check in periodically. And so I think an area of focus for us when we focus on technology is going to be increased communication about students' performance when they're, um, you know, going from a, you know, (coughs) solid 85 in math over a period of time down to 70s. Um, So maybe that's through partnering with community school or the Athenaeum for some training classes on how to use Aspen in Google Classroom. I just, I feel like we we may create a vacuum of miscommunication or missed opportunity to track, help parents track their students' success, so. Yep, I I think that's a valid point. I think we've talked, haven't done it, but we've talked about um, parent workshops, not just on Aspen and Google Classroom, but on social media too, yeah. and just kind of, you know, technology for for parents and in general. Um, if if participation at <coughs> coffees is any uh, indication, like it's it's hard to kind of put some of these together because participation isn't great, um, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try it um, because I think. Um, we don't want it to be a barrier right. so um, and, and that's kind of my good point advice. partnering with some of the other organizations that maybe have access to parents and or the community <coughs> at large in different ways to just keep trying to engage them because to your point I, I get it sometimes you can feel like you hit a wall with that communication but I think it's really important it's happening so quickly and I know you know as somebody who works on computers all the time 
I don't have a deficit with that. But if, to be honest, my husband who's in construction, if he was the one responsible for tracking, you know, our kids' grades, it, it, it would take him time to learn how to do it because he's not in front of a computer all the time and it's not natural to him. Whereas for me, I can have 15 tabs open on my dual screens. And um, so I just, I, I offer that as a suggestion, not just for CPS, but for everybody as we move towards this heavy technology. Yep. The other piece of that question about just updating Aspen regularly is, is not addressed in this improvement plan, but addressed in, in we give like a, a teacher handbook. And so this year, like we've made a point at CPS to say like, you've setting up a regular pattern for updating Aspen so that excellent. there's not a void. Yeah, excellent. Because I think we have talked about that there can be some inconsistencies where some teachers are updating every week and some are updating every quarter. And if you do know how to log in and you see it and you're like, oh my God, why is my kick out of zero? And they don't actually. Right. So thank you. That's great. Selma. So, just to piggyback on that just a little bit, um, and I'm one of those parents, I haven't quite gotten used to Aspen. Is there is there a way that it can notify you, like an automatic? Like notif when your bank balance is low. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 so that's just something for all the schools to, to kind of look at. That kind of helps parents. You know, those parents that are up at three a.m. checking their emails, type thing, and they go like, "Oh yeah, right." So um, you know, I think we're a small enough community that some of the teachers email us directly, uh, which I got one of those emails recently. I was happy for. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that's just something to put out there for you guys. Thank you. I think that is really important, especially at the middle mm -hmm. school, because I, NES parents, I think, are used to the parent-teacher conference, that face-to-face -face meeting where you learn about what your student's doing and their progress or areas that they struggle. And so at CPS, without those meetings and only having that technology you know, piece of knowing how your student is doing it can be a struggle I, I could imagine for many families so and it's a great maybe imagination item for mm -hmm. the school council to talk about as you know like how do how do we keep our finger on the pulse of that important parent teacher dialogue as we move to really heavy technology communication right. yep. uh, just a couple quick thoughts on that so one is please note that if you're a parent of a middle school student, you can schedule a meeting at any time. Um, so even though we don't have a designated day for parent-teacher conferences, mm -hmm. you certainly can do that. And um, one thing that, that might be an outcome of one of these um, uh, imagination items, the advisory program, is potentially um, a return mm -hmm. to um, student-led uh, conferences, which allows uh, students to come in, parents to come in with their student um, and uh, talk about progress, and, and it's, it's an innovative way to um, keep track of progress mm. and for kids to take more responsibility. So that's often a part of um, robust advisory programs in middle schools. Mm -hmm. um, so Great. stay tuned yeah. for that. Just one comment on that is that having the children go through all the schools, I've never had a teacher tell me that they couldn't or wouldn't allow me to mm -hmm. email them or call them. Mm -hmm. And I think that in my experience, teachers have been so responsive in emails. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it takes the time to do that, but if you're checking your child's grades or you're concerned and you don't know how to go onto Aspen, all of the emails are listed. And I, as I say, I think our teachers are fabulous mm. in being able to correspond. And I can't even imagine what that is like when you've got 20 plus kids in right. five different classes. Mm -hmm. you know, but I just want to make that comment. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. <coughs> Thank you, Melissa. That's a good point. Well, thank my Hello. colleague, Dr. Cohen, for the lead-in for what will be viewed as a rather unimaginative high school <laughs> school improvement plan. <laughs> um, just to uh, answer a question Zona just asked, at the high school this year, we uh, employed a feature in Aspen for automatic attendance notifications. Mm -hmm. So if a student has been absent from a course um, seven days in a semester course, you will get an automatic notification, and then that will go at 9, 11, and then 15 will be your student is in danger of losing credit, come in to schedule. So that'll be for semester and year-long courses. My guess is with most things in Aspen, we can pay them <laughs> to create uh, a feature for a notification like that. I'm sure it's possible. Thank you. So I want to thank the school council first. Um, the way the schedule works, we have a tri-council meeting in September, 
and then we break off into our I individual school councils, but it's a lot of work uh, to review and update the plan, so they came back for a second mm. September uh, school council meeting, so I just wanted to express my appreciation uh, for the work the high school council did. Um, we have a uh, three-year school improvement plan, and we are in the third year. So what I did was highlight any areas that have changed, because you have seen this plan now um, for two years. This is the third. Um, the reason the highlight for the PSAT, we used to administer that during the school day. We would do the Wednesday administration. Um, I'm not sure this will be articulate, but the return on investment for us uh, was not good. Um, the loss of instructional time to take uh, an entire morning. Um, ninth graders, we had to create, in essence, uh, an activity for them. It was a nice opportunity for seniors to have some college application day to work on their essay. Um, but testing always went over, and then we were in the middle school uh, schedule and fighting for cafeteria space. So the PSAT offers a Saturday uh, administration, and we're going to do it on Saturday this year. And we really haven't taken a huge hit in participation. We have about a 55% participation right now, rate right now between the two classes. So um, we will no longer be tracking the participation rate for PSAT. Um, well, we will still track it, but right. you will see a mm. precipitous drop because when we did it during the school day, we were in the 90s mm -hmm. of participation. Mm -hmm. um, the school improvement plan goal uh, mm. for academic achievement, again, highlighted the math uh, goal. And when we get to some of the results, um, I will note uh, that we did not make the achievement uh, in mathematics uh, that we wanted on several of the metrics that we follow. Page five, again, just focusing on supervision and evaluation. Next school uh, improvement plan goal in the plan is goal two, ensure a safe culture and climate uh, for all students. And again, we haven't changed any of the metrics uh, that we're uh, following. On page seven, goal three, uh, because we went one-to-one -one this year in grades 9, 10, and 11, in BYOD in grade 12, we added uh, expand the appropriate use of technology for instruction and communication. Um, and I like the way the council formed the metric, the objective, the strategy that we follow. Um, appropriately engaged technology as a resource uh, for teaching and learning. I don't want it to be that when we became a one-to-one -one school, this became the single vehicle for instruction. And as I walk around and observe classes, teachers are appropriately uh, using it as a resource, but people are still um, reading paper books in front of them. Everything isn't online now. Page eight is when you get into all of the great uh, and interesting data and information. I'll remind you that we don't do the apples to oranges comparison of the class of 2015 to the cl class of 2016. We do a three year rolling average compared to the last graduating class. Um, as you can see, our percentage in mathematics is still uh, not with the state average. Um, we did, however, uh, in the goal for math, say we wanted to improve an open response, which we did, and some of the focus areas that we had in mathematics, we also saw improvement. So in the aggregate, the goal is not where we want it to be, but when you start to break it down and disaggregate, we're seeing improvement in some of the areas where we focused. Then you have um, honor roll, slight drop, the percentage uh, of taking AP classes went up, which is no surprise because the number of AP classes that we offered went up. So we put um, AP art in last year, AP Spanish in, um, and brought back um, statistics was the second year of bringing back statistics. Um, we saw uh, a nice piece with the ACT is the number of students in the graduating class of 2016 took the ACT and the overall score compared to the three-year rolling average went up. Um, things to celebrate in SAT and critical reading and writing, but certainly not uh, the improvement we wanted to see in math as that is practically flat, 488 to 488 mm -hmm. over time. 
On the uh, next page for academic achievement, you have the decrease in number of Ds and Fs. I wrote next to that no bueno, um, <laughs> because in both Ds and Fs, uh, there was an increase for the class of 2016. On our uh, positive culture and climate, uh, you can see uh, the attendance rate, slight uptake, the number of students participating in co-curricular activities, and I might just note that we're increasing the number of co-curricular activities. We started the volleyball team at the club level last year. This year we have cross country uh, at the club level, so I would anticipate that that will continue to go up as well. Um, we have a number of new clubs. Uh, I just got a request from students to bring back the sustainability club. For th those of you that were here when we put the wind turbine in, uh, there was a pretty hearty group of students who took the sustainability club seriously and participated in that. And so it's nice to see uh, that coming back around. Latin club started this year. The Chinese club continues. So there's you know, some of the staples that we've had, Student Council and National Honor Society, but it's nice to see students proposing uh, new and different clubs at the high school. We continue to do um, programs with ASAP and the police department and the fire department. The school to career program is pretty robust uh, this year with our, uh, a few of our juniors and a number of our seniors going out and partnering with um, community organizations. On page 11, um, we just uh, put for the measurable school goal, uh, the engaging technology as a resource for learning. Um, we are pretty pleased with the launch of that this year. In October 19th, um, we'll have some pretty rich professional development. John Clements, who is the principal of Nipmuc Regional High School in the Menden Upton School District, they went one-to-one -one, uh, two years ago and have done a lot of neat stuff. Uh, with integrating technology both for teachers and for students and so he and his uh, assistant principal are going to come down on that early release day and work mm -hmm. with our staff. And that Great. is the hopefully imaginative Thank school you. improvement plan. Thank you. Zona, I'll start with you. Um, I noticed you said you don't do a year to year you know class comparison or, or what have you. Is there a reason why you don't do it for the high school? I think it gives the results to see over time, three-year rolling average, rather than just ca comparing year to year, just like for the MCAS results, looking at that cohort over time, rather than just the class of 215 as compared to 260. I absolutely love the three-year rolling average, but I also would like to see from year to year, personally myself, but you know what, I'll go back and pull the old improvement plans and, and get that information. I can give it to you. No problem. Um, I, I want to say uh, this is for overall. I like to see that these plans get emailed out to the, the respective groups and or parents. I know they're going to be posted on the website, and the website's wonderful and fine. Thank you, Logan. The website looks fantastic. It's easy to move around. But sometimes when you have it in your face, you can get a better feel for you know what's going on. I mean, if we wait for people to go out to the website and pull information, we'll be waiting until hell freezes over. We know how that goes. But I think these are wonderful, and I think uh, the councils that worked on them did a wonderful job. I just would like to get them in people's face. So that's my suggestion and recommendation. Very Thank good. you. Thank you, Zona. And just to tack on to that, maybe with the four bullet points of things that have changed in them, just because I think that makes it easier to, I mean, it certainly makes it easier for me to digest it. Um, John, the, um, the, on the um, quarterly newsletter, Whaler Chronicle, yes. um, are you changing that to go through ASPIT, like, it, or are you just canceling it? Because I noticed it was too expensive for the constant contact. Are you changing a delivery method, or are we just yep, not we'll doing it? we'll send it through ASPIT this year. Um, Great. Because you can pay for that great, through Aspen? Yes. <laughs> Constant Contact was a great um, resource yeah. because you could number of people that opened it and they gave you a lot of interesting data points, yeah. if not sometimes sad yeah. data <laughs> points. Um, but it was cost per Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and what is Connect Ed? Connect Ed is our Blackboard we system base. where okay. robocalls. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Because um, I, I thought it was. I saw a hyphen college planning and I thought somehow it was a guidance 
tool, but that's really Naviance. Naviance stamp. is the guy used. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Tim. Why the increase in DNFs, Ds and Fs? I don't know. Okay. Pertinent to that class, perhaps? <laughs> Senioritis? Uh, actually, I, I thought about that, and <clears throat> while you could say um, put it on the students as performance, it could also be increasing rigor. It, it's, hard, it's hard to say which end of the spectrum it might be. The dropout percentage, I mean, that's sort of an obscure number. I mean, I'm wondering if that realistically could be broken down into, for example, students that come in at the high school that have not had <coughs> gone to school for the last several years, as opposed to, and are really looking to get some English before they go out into the workforce, as compared to kids that have gone through the system. I mean, because that, it's a nebulous number. Yeah. In the school improvement plan, I would agree with you, it is a nebulous number. That's why I do a separate presentation. The, the state issues that dropout percentage for you, but when, when that comes out, I then present to school committee the disaggregated information mm -hmm. over time of, because I, as I say, there's a personal story to each mm -hmm. student that decides to drop out. So that, in the school improvement plan, you're not going to get that information. Okay. Thank you, Pauline. All right. I have a quick question. Sorry. Um, you hear students always talking about uh, the SAT test being given. How often is the ACT given here? We were approved to uh, add a second date this year, so we okay. had it in late August or early September, and it will come again, I believe, in April. Okay. We do not offer it as many times as we do the SAT. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. All right, comments from the public. Mr. Dixon. Uh, I'll start with the good stuff. I'll start with the best stuff. Um, the uh, improvement uh, going from 2015 to 2016 in terms of the percentage of students scoring level four, meeting ex expectations in level five, exceeding expectations, in math in the elementary school was extraordinary. Went from 33% in 2015 to 48%. And a year ago we were 21 percentage points behind the state and we made up 15 percentage points and the state did not go up commensurate. So there was a real fantastic improvement on that. Um, the science score for the high school was excellent. We are significantly, on a statistical basis, above the state average, which is very unusual for us in anything. 73% uh, were advanced or proficient, and we came in at 80%. And that isn't a one-off number because the AP stuff, and particularly in biology last year, where we had, uh, four years ago, we had 11 students take the AP biology exam, and every single one of them scored a one, which is the lowest you could get. Last year we had 11 students and seven of them passed. And if you think freshman biology is hard, and boy, it is hard. AP biology is through the roof, so there's been fabulous improvement there. Uh, English, at the high school level and at the middle school level, uh, we have at eighth grade consistently over the last several years been very close to the state average in terms of uh, advanced and proficient uh, in eighth grade English. And we are at the same level, above the Latin level, uh, for 10th grade English. So uh, English is, is at that level strong, and it's also buttressed by fabulous performance <laughs> on both the AP English Lit and the AP Language exams, which consistently score above state averages in terms of getting three to five and the amount of students, the juniors and seniors who take those courses as a percentage of the classes is significantly high. So uh, excellent stuff there. Um, John mentioned extracurricular with the volleyball and the cross country. I mean, extracurriculars just always, they are so fabulous mm -hmm. and they keep getting better. It's hard to imagine and with that, 
is the um, the uh, facilities from the soccer field to the um, to the swimming pool and everything else. Fabulous facilities. We are mm. so fortunate. Absolutely. We need these great facilities. We have them. You know, needing them is one thing. Getting them is another. We've got them. Mm -hmm. so fabulous jobs on that. Now, having spent my first few comments on the good stuff, I hope I can say... Oh, let's just keep it to the positive tonight. <laughs> having spent the beginning of it on the positive, I'd like to express some concerns, particularly, say, on the, on the CPI. Uh, and as Michael explained, um, the goal when we established 2011 as a base year was to cut in half the percentage of students who were not proficient or advanced. For example, if we had 64% proficient and advanced in ELA, within six years, the goal was to increase that by 18 percentage points, half the 100 minus 64. The problem with that, and I, I know it's in the weeds, but uh, this, this is a very big concern for me. Uh, in ELA, which is supposed to be our system-wide strong point, uh, across the board, not only are we failing to meet the goals of improvement, but we are actually, in grades three through eight for ELA in 2016, we were below the 2000 level base. So we are actually regressing. And when you look at ELA across the entire public school system, uh, all three schools, and you break it down by cohorts, whether it's all students, black students, Hispanic students, high need students, ELL students, once again, in ELA, we are 100% for the data that we have, which was through 2015, below where we were in 2011. So we're not, not only are we not making any progress, we're regressing uh, in terms of that metric. Um, for math on the CPI, for 2015, which is the only data we have, as best as I can tell, system-wide by large cohorts, uh, every single cohort that we have is well below the target level that was set for 2015. One of the reasons that our percentile rating for NES and CPS has gone down for each of the four years that we've looked at it uh, since we got the base percentile rating five years ago. One of the reasons is, is that we are massively failing to significantly improve the CPI of our minority students. We aren't even close with the rest of the state. Here's an example. And by the way, when I talk about percentiles, the state ranks all like schools, like all elementary schools, all middle schools, and all high schools on a 1 to 99 percentile basis. And our elementary school was at 20 last year, which meant that 80% of our schools across the state were ranked higher. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Dixon, I need you to wrap up your comments, please. Okay, uh, I'll wrap it up then by talking about percentiles on minority students. On a 1 to 99 basis, we were in 2015, compared to the rest of the state, at the two percentile level in ELA and math for Hispanic students and six percentile uh, level uh, for um, black students, which meant that 98% of the schools were doing better than we were in raising their CPIs and 94% of the schools statewide were doing better than us. And I'll give you more detail in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments? No. All right, moving on to discussions and votes to be taken. We have a generous gift donation from PM Reese Trucking for 30 yards of mulch. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to approve the September 20th meeting minutes, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Thank Still you. Closed. 
Any opposed? Thank you. May I have a motion? Does anyone have any questions or comments on the transfers and invoices before I ask? Okay. May I have a motion to approve the transfers and invoices? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Enrollment update. Okay. So you have uh, been sent actually today um, the enrollments for October 1st. Uh, those are the official enrollments that the state uses for a, a number of um, comparisons that they do. I, I think it's Im interesting to see that the total number of 1588 is um, um, slightly, but I think the September report was 1584. I don't, think no. No. I don't think that's right. I don't think the sheet that I have is right. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the updated one. Yeah. Um, 1595, right. We corrected that today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so it's a, it's a little bit less than September. Um, that isn't unusual, um, but I think it's interesting that the 1588 compared to June, which was 1596. Um, so for the first time in in quite some time, we've gone down from June to um, now, and that's I'm sure if you if you look at the kindergarten numbers of '84, that explains that mm. drop system wide because it's a much smaller kindergarten class but still than we've had. Ahead um, of where we were a year ago right, today. Mm. and the is, mm -hmm. you'll you'll find that the elementary and middle school are slightly um, less than last year and uh, and the major growth has been in the high school um, because of those large freshman sophomore junior classes so interesting to look it's mm. it's uh, from my perspective nice to have a little bit of the respite on the growth um, so that we can catch our breath um, a little bit yet. no <laughs> I know um, and you know we talk about we talk about our testing wow. Um, you know, and it's not about any one year, it's about trend data. So, um, so that, that's the report on enrollment. Um, I've provided for you a, um, a survey, the survey results um, of the calendar issue on consecutive weeks versus um, um, a week in February and a week in April. And uh, I think, first of all, we've had over almost 300 um, returns on that survey, which is pretty high. Um, and so it's, I just thought it would be interesting for you to see the breakout. Clearly, uh, there are more people who, who favor the separate weeks. Um, and then if you look at staff, um, the percentage difference from the staff's perspective is even more marked um, on that issue. And we had three students who, um, who joined the, the survey. The comments, I just took uh, some comments that I thought reflected the volume of comments. I would welcome any school committee member or anybody else that wants to look through um, the results. It's It's, interesting reading. Um, oftentimes you'll find something cited as both a comment in support of two consecutive weeks and a comment in support of two separate weeks. Um, so uh, I thought you'd be interested. I think the, the other thing that was very clear was that um, as for starting before Labor Day, probably was closer to 95%. <laughs> um, against that and that's not a surprise to any of us in a, um, a tourist mm -hmm. industry as, as we have here mm -hmm. so um, how long will we stay up Mike you know um, I'm not sure that I would keep it on a lot longer because you can see the responses have decreased you know by the day um, what was, what happened, why do we have so many on the 22nd do you think when it first went That's out. when it first went yeah. out, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, um, <laughs> everybody was reading their email that day. Yeah. <laughs> the newspaper, and the newspaper. So, I, I, 
have a couple parents email me who are not on social media and they were sort of did this email come in and so I wonder if it's not worth one more email yeah. push you know the the decision out of 300 people is not totally clear and I do think if we're taking the time to get opinions and lieu of a form of forum keeping it out for it till our next meeting is not going to do any harm but I would love to see some um, support from the admin to send it out again to parents via their their email routes I agree with that I mean mm -hmm. it's close 180 to 100 mm. is it's not you yeah know, really clear yeah. and, and I don't I, I just want to be clear I don't think that at least personally I don't have an agenda or really an opinion one way or the other but I think it's a, a wonderful exercise for us and somewhat of a a simple but impactful matter to get okay. community feedback and it's mm -hmm. it's deserving of some some time absolutely yeah, no, I agree I don't, I don't have Sorry. I, I don't have would you like me to say it again <laughs> 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 Sorry. Just kidding. Siri yes. let me speak louder yeah I agree I mean I don't have a, a, a gender either um, my daughter's graduating next year so I mean but I do think it is a great exercise and I do think it shows the community that we are willing and, and, and want to put out this information and get feedback from mm -hmm. the community. So um, if we could hold it until the next school meet, committee meeting, mm -hmm. that would be great. Well, there's there's no vote on the calendar tonight. So right. mm -hmm. um, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can do whatever the Was school it, committee any other likes. things that we, we were looking back on the calendar? I can't remember. The, I'll have to go back and look at the minutes when we last saw the... I think it was the it was the starting before Labor Day, Labor Day and okay. I think that you know I, the question will remain out there with the survey, but I think Mike's right that mm -hmm. the answer is fairly obvious what what people's preferences are. Qu quite frankly, I wouldn't even ask that question again in future years. Mm -hmm. I, that's that's yeah. been done. Mm -hmm. We've heard it. It's overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. What more are we going to do? If you, if you read some of these surveys. <laughs> Um, there are a few that are a little testy and saying, you know, why do you continue to ask these questions? <laughs> um, I've heard that from really? a few parents, didn't you? So, Wasn't this a discussion So you'd be interested to, to read them? Yes, I have heard. Yeah. <laughs> because it did, um, we did discuss this last year. Yep. Did we? The two-week vacation? <laughs> the two -week yeah, vacation? the two-week vacation. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. take them. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> This shows we're um, open for consideration. That's right, <laughs> just in case anyone wants. The On the Horizon, um, we uh, will have next um, meeting a report from Jeremiah on the ESL, which will include um, some of the data that he has been able to gather, not just about numbers of students, and um, but also their access uh, scores and improvements so um, that will be coming up I think that um, we generally have a, a homeschooling report there aren't a lot of students typically and uh, Martin will provide a first quarter budget update um, I, I think the question of whether you want to have um, mask come and report to you um, about the um, role of school councils. Um, I think that the um, the administration has been able to work with their school councils to educate um, <laughs> anything that that uh, Mr. Kucher could mm -hmm. offer. Mm -hmm. But there have been years where you have invited Mr. Kucher um, to the meeting, so. If that is something that you desire, um, I would have to try to schedule it. And I'm not even sure that he might be available on the 18th. Not after the charter school vote. Yeah. No. Mm. Do we know oh. how many, uh, and I'm just by poll, how many new school council members there are? Because I would imagine, you know, having Glenn come on a cycle of every other year is healthy and informative mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. refreshing everyone's or new members, uh, m you know, jogging memories and educating new members on what the role and responsibility of the school counselor. I'm not sure. I'm convinced it has to be every year. 
Um, but I do think it's beneficial. And I do enjoy him coming to Nantucket and sharing with us some of the broader issues school committees mm -hmm. are facing mm -hmm. uh, in the district. Yeah, no, I I, again, I don't think it has to happen every year. I agree. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Any subcommittee updates? Work through updates? No? Sure. I would just would like to give a shout out to our JV football team, our soccer team, and our cross country team because um, they all showed up for community service at mm. the Nantucket project last weekend. And the reports I got back that they came in with a wonderful attitude. They were a great help, and um, they were really a great, um, I think, a, a, a great show for our school and uh, school spirit. So. Thank you. I just would like to say I attended two of the open houses and they seemed very well attended. It was very exciting to see all of the families there enjoying their students' work. So, thank you. I did, with your permission, have one other thing. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to um, note that um, Sophie Cool was named a commended student in the um, 2000, I think it's 17 National Merit um, Scholarship Program, and just wanted to make sure that uh, that she was acclaimed. She is wonderful. And sorry. <laughs> First step balloon. Sorry. Um, sure. I, I think uh, the other thing that I guess is already out in the community. Um, the public schools um, through the community school have been working with the um, early education department in um, in Boston and we hope um, that we will be reopening we whalers um, within I, I'll say a week but that's that's sort of a moving target because there's hiring to do and, and a lot of things but um, I want to commend Caitlin for doing a lot of legwork um, and some challenging um, budget development and um, approvals and you know sort of maneuvering through um, the state and, and it's not an easy thing to um, accomplish so we're excited that we'll be able to um, sort of put our finger in the dike and and keep it up and running and then at the same time we'll be working um, to to uh, help find somebody to continue that work after August of, of next year so will that have any budget impact for us um, we're we are trying very hard um, to really make it break even. We, we don't want to make money um, on this endeavor, um, but we also can't afford to have the community school take a hit. And so um, we've been writing grants. Um, Caitlin's working with several different grant opportunities. Um, the biggest challenge, quite honestly, is that um, by having the community school take it over, um, we assume we will assume the health insurance costs for a group of people that haven't had health insurance before and so that you can imagine is a significant um, number and yet um, we think that we can pull it off thanks to um, the participation of several community agencies through the grant process wow. so um, it'll be close you know it, it personally even if we took a small hit financially it's worth it and um, I think this is an example of what Nantucket does when when there's a problem on, in the community and somebody needs to step up um, Nantucket steps up and for its children and so this is just uh, another example of that Thank in you. the community. I would agree. I think Thank it's you. important that we be able to answer that question if it, if it comes up, but I wholeheartedly support that sentiment. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, Absolutely. I say the same to Mike and Martin um, for their support in this entire process. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm.
May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. I know. It's hard. <laughs>